can okay. do that. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our summer PD event. I'm Kristen Vanderveen and I am the current president of NEACT. And um, this is the fifth of our summer PD events. Um, and we're really excited to see so many people here. And um, here to learn about chemistry and to talk about using storylines in chemistry. Um, if you uh, aren't already a NEACT member, there are a lot of new faces in this group. Uh, in this session today, I do encourage you to go to NEACT.org and consider joining the organization. We offer chemistry PD by chemistry teachers all year round. And so um, I really would encourage everyone to continue to come to future events. Uh, that's where everything will be posted in the future. All of the registration will be through our website. Um, we've just redesigned it. So I encourage you to, to um, get involved with that. Um, and so I wanna welcome everyone here today and uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, Danny Jackson is presenting today on using storylines to teach chemistry. She is a 14 year veteran chemistry and science teacher from Westchester County, New York. She is an active member of Stannis and AACT, and she recently started using storylines as a means of engaging students in learning chemistry. Through questioning and investigating aspects of the science, she helps her students to gain understanding of how the science works while solving real life problems. Um, and so I'm going to turn this over to Danny and let her get going. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, I'm just gonna try to change my little view so I can maybe see people if you guys chime in. And so please, <clears throat> I, I like my classroom like an interactive space. Um, so I do, I, Kristen's gonna monitor the chat uh, for me, but um, you know, if you wanna raise your hand in the little uh, Zoom, you know, raise your hand, you'll pop up to the top of my screen and unmute, unmute your camera like chime in, please, please. Um, it works so much better as I tell my kids when it's a conversation and not a lecture. Um, and so I was really grateful when uh, Niak asked for people to present. I love sharing what I've done in my classroom, hearing what other people have done in their classroom. Um, and the cool thing, I, I don't know, I didn't see all the names that came up, uh, but I saw Shifra pop in and um, Shifra and I have done a, a lot of um, the meetups with the iHub people in Colorado as we worked through using this uh, specific set of storylines, but um, I'm by no means tied to. Uh, it is just what I'm most familiar with at the moment. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of slides um, just to keep myself on track because otherwise I will totally go off in 18 directions. And um, like I said, if you have a question, you know, try to jump in and, and ask it. If it's something that you're like, oh, I'm just gonna hold that to the end, um, we'll definitely have time for uh, discussion and questions. So uh, a lot of people are like, what's a storyline? And, you know, here's a real quick summary um, that I had written out, but I would say that any unit you do is probably a storyline. It's just that a lot of my units used to be generated around a concept. So I want to teach everything about atomic structure, or I want to teach everything about bonding. And instead of doing it that way, it's more about how do we solve this problem or question or what are all the things in chemistry that are involved in answering or, or coming to a solution of some real life thing that's way more interesting than learning about the history of the atom from, you know, Democritus all the way through current. Way more complicated physics than I really even love once we get down to the, to the stuff that's totally not tangible. So, um, Many of you probably use NGSS here in New York. We use um, NISLIS because New York had to be a little bit different. And so our NGSS has a few things added back in, in certain topics, especially in chemistry, where we didn't, we fought uh, tooth and nail to not uh, eliminate acids and bases and 
solutions and some um, electrochemistry off the top of my head. Um, but I would remind everyone, right, that it's all the standards are just a minimum. Like here's the minimum bar you need to hit. And then everything over that, you know, is gravy as far as state assessments go. Um, and the same thing goes with the storylines. Like there's a certain amount of information you need, but if you're doing a good question board, then you're bound to get some tangents which are appropriate and align with the main idea. But in bringing in those interests, you end up getting uh, a, a much richer story in the end. And so, you know, like I said, I totally take this trap on the right where um, you, you zoom around and you go from point A to point B, but passing, you know, 18 other things in the process. If you've done the right side correctly, you can boil it down to the, you know, concept map on the left. And I bring up concept maps because they are very useful, but I've got to get away from there only being one right concept map because that's not, not the truth for us anymore. There's so many different ways to represent things. Um, there's different ways to tell the story. And if you take out some of the, you know, 13 letter SAT words, there the kids can can do this more effectively building it themselves as you work through letting them guide the way, which is really sort of the intent of being able to do storylines. Um, so as I said before, the one that I've used uh, most is Inquiry Hub out of University of Colorado Bol uh, Boulder, and their website is incredible. What I will say though, is that if you don't know how to navigate it, you will look at it and go, holy hell, how do I do this? Um, they have lots of stuff out there for the high school level. So they've got biology and chemistry. I did not look this summer to see if they've added any earth science or physics. Um, but what I love about the materials that they provide, one, they are vetted, they've been piloted, they've been reviewed, um, They've been used in real classrooms and the, the documents are all things that you can move into Google Drive, make a copy of them, and then you can edit them as you see fit. And so you can decide to switch around lessons, you can decide to skip a lesson, you can add stuff in that you've done. Um, and what they love is, what I love is that they hold these iHub meetup zooms they're like 45 minutes every other week through the school year and we got to like share out hey you know there's a typo here or hey i have this great idea you know this would fit really well in this part um and so i would say that the thing that it's done the most for me is i don't have to start from scratch I, I ultimately would love to be able to write much smaller storylines, much more compact, you know, little units with um, a little bit more individual focus. I will say that their units are really big and I would like ones that are about this big, but there is time and place for, for both. Um, and so the other website that has some resources, Next Generation Science Storylines, um, and I will say iHub is built off of Next Generation Science Storylines. It's built off of, um, so it has the same sort of framework and format to trying to, to build the curriculum uh, that you're not giving everything away before you get started. Um, when you get to a page, I, of course, focus on chemistry. Um, I do teach uh, an ecology class, but it doesn't really align with us with these storylines i sort of have those conveniently because that wasn't a tested class like a, not a state test driven class i had inherently um built units that 
that are storylines. And what I've learned from trying this in the last year is that the irony is, is that when I became a teacher 15 years ago, I came in from real industry and real government jobs that I'd had before. And I came in and I was like, so how's this organized? And the two very veteran teachers said, well, you know, you're going to go from atomic structure and the history of the atom, you know, and you're going to progress to, you know, balancing equations and stoichiometry by midterms. And then, you know, the second half of the year, you'll do, um, you know, solutions and acids and bases and titration and kinetics and equilibrium and redox and organic and nuclear. And I was like, whoa, okay. Um, but why can't we just flip that? Why can't we start with the big things and just fill in the gaps with, with all the pieces of information they need to understand it? And I was very quickly told, nope, that's not how we do it. Fall in line, you're, you're a new teacher, do what we say. And irony has it that, you know, a dozen years later, huh, here we come back to, oh, what if we do it from macro to micro? Which is essentially how I feel like a lot of this works. Um, so I feel very comfortable in it. That being said, anytime you're using somebody else's resources, um, there's bound to be a discomfort level. But I was very honest with my kids that this was the first time we were implementing this sort of set of programs and that, you know, they should bear with me because I didn't, I didn't write it. Like I didn't write their textbook, you know, that I used to give out that's dated 1996 and half the stuff in there is, you know, every periodic table and every book I own is not up to date. So I encouraged them to, to come along for the ride. And most of them were very cooperative in that. Um, what you will see on this page is this is it. This is the entire uh, five units that IHUB has written for chemistry at the high school level. Um, it is, everything is a suggestion, uh, suggested, I suppose, that you do it in this order. Um, I made it through Search for Life and about half of Fuels last year. Um, and then I, I bailed and I did nuclear chemistry uh, when everything went crazy between Russia and Ukraine. I felt like the news when I remember sitting in my desk uh, and here and reading an article about how uh, the biggest nuclear power plant or second biggest nuclear power plant in Europe was just taken over. And I went, oh my God, I need to teach my kids nuclear. I did not jump to the storyline because I felt like I needed some comfort space to be able to do it. I still tried to do it in a storyline manner, but I didn't follow a format. Um, I have been through the oysters unit with my Stannis work group. Um, I've been through the nuclear unit a little bit uh, with the Stannis work group, and I have not unpacked the polar ice unit at all. Um, but within each of these, there's no one topic that's learned. I'm going to say not taught, but learned as you go. Um, and so while you're like, oh my God, how can you only have five things? Um, Anybody who's tried it can also attest to the fact that you won't get through all five in one year the first time you try to go through the process because there's such a learning curve for everybody's individual. How many days a week do you see the kids? How many minutes a day, um, et cetera. And we are still not out of the pandemic. And so, you know, what happens when, you know, seven kids in your class are out that day for eight days or two weeks or whatever? So it's still a work in progress for me. I <clears throat> wanted to talk about the biology, even though that's not our focus, but to recognize that many people teach multiple topics. And I actually really enjoy the biology ones. I just don't teach biology or living environment uh, currently. So I don't have a method. I do know that for biology and earth science, in New York, uh, our state tests are changing sooner than physics and chemistry. And so our teachers are trying different ways to, to align to the new standards and biology and earth science, biology especially has a lot of good stuff out there. Um, Illinois Science Teachers Association had a work group for storylines. Uh, new Visions has storylines. 
um, for high school. And then Open Syed has a lot of middle school stuff. And I would say it's not such a bad thing to start with a middle school unit and then just build it up a little bit more for your level of high school kids and what you need to stretch that to, um, especially as you just dip your toe in the pool. So, you know, the three big bio topics that you can pretty much teach almost everything else within evolution, genetics and heredity and ecosystems um, also readily available. Um, and that was just another page. So I thought I would really quickly encourage you to, you know, just dive in and I would not say print it, like you'll have a binder this thick if you're printing things. Um, but in within Google, you know, you can open that, you can save a, a, a folder and then you can read through the different things and you can mark it up once you've made a copy of it. So they start with a skeleton and I would say the NGSS website as well as iHub does this, uh, starts with the storyline skeleton and then breaks down within the unit. Then within the unit for every lesson, there's a teacher guide. Um, there's also student worksheets. There's frequently not a full set of answer keys, depending on what resource you're looking at. Um, and the teacher guide takes a little bit of getting used to to read through it. But once you've gone through it like a student, like if I had to say, spend a weekend doing something, I would totally go through the Google slides that are attached and the teacher guide and the student um, handouts. And I would print out the student handout and literally go and do what everything asks you to do um, to feel like the student. I tried in search for life and I got like four lessons in before I did that. And I was like, oh, wait, I missed all these things in the teacher guide because I was trying to figure out how to time it um, and to actually go through it and sort of write yourself an answer key of what you think the kids are going to say. Um, and the teacher guide gives you a lot of prompts and a lot of, well, maybe this, if that. And it's all, mm, could there be another right answer? Absolutely, right? That's the whole idea of a storyline is it's very open-ended. Uh, so if anybody out there is from New York, it's not like a New York State Regents multiple choice test. Um, so this teacher guide section is, is probably the most important thing. You will see right next gen storylines, um, this, the green box and the blue box, this is carried through to um, iHub. I, I can't speak for new visions. I haven't um, opened up new vision stuff. And unfortunately there's no chemistry stuff out of Illinois Science Teachers Association yet, although they keep promising there will be. Um, but if you can get the kids to buy these three ideas at the green box, we figure out science, we figure out where we're going at each step and we figure out how to put the ideas together over time. We, it's a we statement, like they have to work as a team. You have to be willing to let them sit in small groups. You have to be willing to let them work it out. Is there some classroom management to be done with the kid who sits there and never says anything or does anything? Absolutely. But if you build a good rapport in your classroom where you can make these groups, I, I really never made my groups bigger than four. Um, again, last year we went back and forth between you can do group work, you can't do group work, you can do group work, you can't do group work. Um, so sometimes they were doing things way more individually than they probably should have been, but I didn't really have a choice. But moving forward, I recognize those places where group work would be more uh, beneficial. Um, and these are things for you to think about. And so I'm going to ask um, you guys in the chat maybe to um, think about these and throw some idea or comments that you might have about how you do this, like how you do it now, right? How do you kick off an investigation in a unit? How do you work with students to motivate them to want to figure out the next thing um, how do you get students to ask deeper, better questions than just the basic question that's on the paper? Curious. 
for other people's sort of ideas. Did I put you all to sleep? Oh, we're here. We're thinking. We're thinking. Sorry, wait time. <laughs> I think you're doing great. I started Inquiry Hub this year and I did a couple of the units. And I think that what you're adding is very helpful. So I'm definitely thinking. Thank you. So Mike, I, I think, right, we've always, we, the chemistry teachers have, have always had an advantage. I feel like we've had an advantage because we've always done demos. I think the catch is that we've done demos and done too much explaining. And so my challenge to myself is always shut up and just show it and then elicit all their voices. And that is the hardest thing for me to do, but demos are, are awesome. Depends on the unit. Uh, I always feel like I don't have discrepant events when I want them. But that's that's great. Um, with the iHub stuff, I did a lot of digital record keeping, and so because the pan, I guess the one benefit to the pandemic was that we use Google Classroom, and I could um, give them digital files and digital due dates, and you know, so they would have you know um, their their handouts. And there'd be times where I, I'd ask them to scan or take a picture of the page they were working on and just, just put that page onto today's assignment. And that would get them their classwork or, or um, you know, activity points for that piece of the puzzle. Definitely a challenge when there was a kid out for multiple days. Um, I wish I had a better answer to that one. I, I think until we get back to what I would call normal where kids aren't out. 25 days a year, um, that's a constant challenge. I do not record myself or post up um, recordings of class lessons. I'd rather they meet with me and we talk about it and catch them up uh, personally. And uh, Ashley, I, I could, if you had a document of all those leading questions, I would totally take it because <laughs> I'm I'm awful at asking questions without giving away giving away exactly what I'm looking for. I, I need to work on broadening my questions. Thanks. So um, some of this is us and some of this is them. I, I say with the new standards and the 3D um, aspect that the kids aren't trained to do it yet. And so they're just trained on memorizing something and regurgitating information back or oh, I'm just going to use the periodic table and find that one fact and I'm and I'm done. And so the challenge is always to get them to do more. I love this graphic. This graphic came from NGSS. Um, and it does not really matter which place you start um, because you inevitably uh, end up coming back to things multiple times. And my big thing is this box right here on the sort of left side, engaging an argument from evidence. In order to do that, you have to obtain evidence and information. You have to ask questions. You might have to develop models. Um, you probably have to do an investigation. You have to analyze the data. Um, maybe there's some math and definitely some, some technology in um, being able to do things using computers and maybe uh, instruments, technology, PASCO, Vernier, et cetera, um, to help you with that. And the green one, constructing explanations and designing solutions sort of really ties to the argument part. In the beginning, I tell the kids, like, I'm not accepting a yes or no answer without a reason why. And also that sometimes there's more than one answer that's right. So don't assume that because somebody else came to a different conclusion that you're wrong. Um, 
I would say that the thing I need to improve on is giving them an opportunity to revise and revise and revise until they get to a better place. That's a time management thing for me um, that I know is a, is a point of growth. But these things, right? These are basically your science and engineering practices. And in our New York state standards, and again, I don't know everybody's state and their standards, but you don't just have a list of facts that kids need to know, right? In New York, we have, we had before NGSS, we had the core curriculum and it had seven standards within it. And standard four had all the technical information, all the content. And one, two, three, and five, six, seven had other things that I rarely read, by the way, until I did a workshop on the standards on NGSS with a group of teachers from my district. And some of them were elementary and some of them were middle school. And actually only one of them was high school. And she sat next to me at work. So I knew she, <laughs> that wasn't the problem. But the lower grades were asking me, well, how does this connect to what we, we have in our, you know, in our old standards? And so I opened it up and I looked through and I realized, holy cow, like the science engineering practices are in the standards. The cross-cutting concepts are in the standards. The actual content, the DCIs, are in the standards. It's just that they're all in separate standards, hence having seven different standards. And so, yeah, we do labs because we're lab science, but we don't actually think about how that crosses over to the real life application of being able to have a skill for a job. I think it did for me, again, because I came from, going to college, doing water quality lab analysis and reporting uh, for a water company, and then doing seven and a half years in uh, environmental regulation in a county government. Um, and so I, I came from that place where you needed all that information and you needed to be able to communicate it. But I have coworkers who've never been outside of a classroom in their adult life outside of, you know, graduating from college. And so they don't have the same perspective I do, which is challenging to me because I'm like, well, of course they're going to do X, Y, and Z with their data because nobody hand graphs thing anymore. I got out of college in 1997. In 1998, I was compiling Excel spreadsheets of 10 and 15 years worth of monthly data that had to then be graphed with the new, you know, six months of data from this year added into the, the report. Nobody's hand graphing that. Excel's doing that for you. And that was a long time ago, like almost 25 years ago. So yes, I want the kids to be able to graph, but really what I want them to be able to do is analyze the information on the graph. And so I focus a lot more on that um, because that's a skill, whether you're reading the Wall Street Journal for stock prices or whether you were reading the water quality data for a oil spill um, or you're reading a, you know, a, a blood work test, you know, and, and tracking all of your, your numbers. You, you need to be able to analyze it, not to plot it. So this, I hope this is as useful for everyone else in thinking about everything we teach should touch on like three or four of these things in every process. You're not gonna hit them all, all the time. Absolutely not. And in NGSS, you're not expected to. Um, and and I, Judy, that's if, uh, Kristen didn't already, my uh, slideshow is accessible for you. And so it's in there, you can grab it. So I wanted to show you some of the stuff my kids did. <laughs> On the left, you will see an incremental modeling tracker. Um, this is a worksheet from iHub that went along with all the lessons. And at the end of each lesson, you were supposed to be able to summarize. I will say I was very bad at being able to do this at the end of every lesson, but what I did do was sort of set it up so that page by page, so a few lessons at a time, they could reflect on what they learned. And a lot of times they'd go back to lesson one and be like, oh, that wasn't right. I said, don't erase it. Nobody said erase anything. I want you to see your growth. And so what this tracker does is allows you to see growth in words and pictures um, and having them draw things that you can't ultimately otherwise see. Um, and it was very hard for me to not mark them up with red pens. I don't know if anybody else loves their red pen, but um, 
I totally have, I haven't gone to standard base grade, grading yet, but uh, I'm trying to very much give feedback and credit for effort. And then when the time comes for quizzes and tests, like you should have been able to process that into something else. But, um, you know, I with the right side, with the modeling, um, this was actually a pretty cool um, uh, lab activity within the fuels unit. And so you take syringe, you put some air in it, you put a stopper on the bottom so that the water can't go in and the air can't come out. And you put this stopper into different temperature beakers. And then what happens to the syringe plunger? And then I wanted them to, to show me how it they could explain what they obviously can't see but knew happened um this is probably the result of you know two or three lessons on this after they played with it and then they also got to do a little bit of research to figure out how and why and we'd watch some videos on how engines worked um and so they definitely, some, some drawings are better than others. I did pick some decent drawings to use as my example um, to, to all of you. <clears throat> I, yeah, I don't know how to get those perfectionist kids to stop erasing. Other than somebody suggested to me recently at a different workshop, if you have a way of taking like an 11 by 17 piece of paper and folding it into a booklet front cover inside left inside right back cover and labeling them um start which is on the front and then the two inside ones are models or drawings that they can do and revise their model as they go along and then the back side is their final model and what that does is it allows you when you open the booklet to then have on the same side backwards, of course, your final and and your initial, and then get them to reflect on how it's changed. So, that, you know, that they know that it's okay. Like you go back and change and fix and change and fix and change and fix um, as they go. And that the only thing that maybe gets graded is something that comes off their final understanding on their final model. Again, I struggle with standards-based grading, um, but I have found the kryptonite for high school students, and that is that they also love stickers and stamps, just like the younger kids. And so I, I don't have any here, you think I would, but I think I've taken them all to school. Um, I have rubber stamps that all fit inside like a one and a half by one and a half inch box, and I do monthly calendars, and I have stamp pads of all colors and stamps of everything you can imagine and they get credit on their calendars that are worth points for showing me their work, right, wrong, or whatever, as long as they've attempted something. And then that's my moment to see their paper, give them a little bit of feedback, send them back to go finish it or start something the next thing. And so <clears throat> that really, they're like, I didn't get my stamp. And I was like, I didn't see your work. And then they come show me. And it doesn't have to be group, but they don't have to share it out uh, for those shy kids. And they tend to be more willing, you know, once we go through this and they realize like, oh, she's not yelling at me or crossing stuff out. Um, so I keep a stack of post-it notes, you know, blank post-it pad, and I jot something down and stick it onto their paper. So sometimes I'm not even writing on their paper. Um, that too has been a, a growth for me because I very much want to circle and highlight all over their papers but I need to not fix it for them, they need to fix it. So a little more student work. This, if anybody has done Search for Life, um, was about greenhouse gases. So it's a little bit of biology and a little bit of chemistry. Uh, I really like how the storyline integrates biology, which for us comes before chemistry and gives them the opportunity to build off prior knowledge and maybe sometimes filling gaps. So I struggled with 
I didn't learn that last year. I was virtual or I, you know, I didn't learn that. Um, I didn't learn anything last year. I was like, well, I highly doubt you didn't learn anything, but I realized where I had to start from and move to based on their lack of knowledge. <clears throat> This right one, again, for anybody with search of life experience, see, you can see that I've modified what they uh, had in the lesson. I instead had small groups work and make posters, and I had them group together things that had something in common. Um, and so I got all sorts of different posters, which was kind of nice that I just didn't have everybody's same thing to grade over and over again. And then I had them do gallery walks and, and list what was similar and different between somebody else's poster and theirs. And some kids made them more colorful. Some kids didn't follow instructions, which was to color the metals. Um, but some groups, like I said, this one was a pretty nice one. I picked good uh, <laughs> student work to show you guys. So hopefully, um, you know, I might have a folder somewhere also of other pictures I had taken because I was trying to just to photo document classwork and student work. Um, so if when this is all done and over with, you need to send me an email and go, oh my God, can I see other examples of what they did? Like I'm reading through these teacher guides and I see these student activity sheets and I don't know what this is supposed to look like when a kid fills it out. I have ample things in the cloud, um, just not at my fingertips while on a Zoom. So I believe it or not, um, that is pretty much the end of my uh, prepared slides. I, I can open up uh, the iHub website and pop through a couple of things or open up my drive and show you some other things. But you know, what do I suggest people to do from here is that the only way it works is, is professional learning communities. I think small groups of people that are willing to take things try it in their classroom, come back together again and hash out what worked, what didn't work. Why? Is it the kids? Is it the materials or is it us? And what I found half the time is that sometimes it's me. <clears throat> um, and my goal, like I said at the beginning, is really to be able to write some of my own that aren't already out there. Um, I'm very interested in finding ways to connect different units to water. So that's like my little niche as well as I really, and I haven't seen anything complete out there unless I've missed it on the internet. I really want a little mini unit on batteries, rechargeable, non-rechargeable, um, and then sort of the ones that now you're using for like solar in the house and uh, Tesla cars and things like that. Like, I think that there's so much application of battery science and battery technology and what's in a battery I'm old enough to remember lead oxide batteries with refillable sulfuric acid wells. Um, and now batteries are non-maintenance, you know, they're maintenance free, which really means you have to throw them out sooner. Um, and is it better technology or not? You know, the fact that, holy cow, this thing, you know, can do so much for us and hold a charge and do crazy. I date myself with my kids. I make fun of myself about how a dinosaur I am because, things are such nanotechnology now, they're so small. How do they do it, right? Like I just, I just throw that question out there to the kids, like, how do you do it? So don't try to write a storyline. Don't try to just jump into next generation science standards, recreating from scratch. There's so many resources out there. And if it's not perfect, it's at least a starting point to um, modify and then just give credit where credit is due. Hey, I started from this and I changed this and adapted in the um, header or footer, you know, adapted from. I give credit where credit is due. And if it works, share, 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 because that's the, the best teachers can do is always just share with each other. So uh, I will stop sharing that. Danny, there's an interesting question in the chat. Okay. About did you, did you implement iHub just in your classroom or was it school wide and did you have to get approval? Like what was your process? So um, 
our biology teachers, which in our school is called living environment until they change it someday when the test changes, um, a small group of biology teachers piloted new visions and they did it as their small group. Um, my supervisor slash AP who then changed jobs and became STEM director of like the district had already tried to encourage chemistry to move in the storyline direction. Um, initially at September, we were getting a new staff member and all four of us, there's four of us who teach chemistry. We were supposed to all teach uh, the storylines and like every good plan, um, two people worked together a lot. Um, and then I did my thing. And then the new teacher was like, this is crazy. I just want to do it the way I used to do it. And her mentor said, sure. And so we were not all aligned as much as I would have liked. Um, we're supposed to have a curriculum day on August 29th before our superintendent day on the 30th, because that's really good forward planning the day before school starts essentially. Um, but I am hoping that the four of us can be on uh, a little bit more of a cooperative level because I think that bouncing, hey, this worked, that didn't work. What are you, you know, doing for this? Or, you know, if we're going to get materials, you know, let's try to order everything for enough for all eight sections at once kind of thing, which is what we've always done. Eh, um, there's theories behind everybody being aligned and there's theories behind everybody doing what they want as long as you get to the same place at the end. I would say that's really hard to do with storylines. Our old curriculum was pretty easy to say, well, if you're off by a couple of weeks, not a big deal. Uh, we also used to do in the old days, um, we'd set up one room with all the lab stations and all the sections would rotate through labs on specific topics within the same couple of days or week. Um, and so that has gone to hell now. And um, sorry, hold on. Um, my dog is about to start barking, just forewarned. Um, pros and cons. I like the, the flexibility and the creativity of being able to do what I want, um, but I miss the continuity of not being a man on an island. Um, nobody's hanging me out to dry on that island yet, <coughs> but um, we're trying to, to be more proactive than other people who in New York are saying, well, I don't wanna do it until I know what the test looks like. And I'm like, just teach them chemistry. Just teach them how to think. The rest of it will fall in, into place. It's, it's not a big deal. And so that is uh, the challenge of having people who come you know, with different sort of senses of what's, I don't wanna to be told by the administration who's not in my classroom, but at the same time, I might like a little more guidance from a, from a department point of view. So I hope that answered your, your question. Uh, I was gonna go back to the- Yeah, there are a couple other questions. One about like starting in it. So um, Lauren wrote in that um, they started with fuels and oysters um, and had done nuclear. So is there a sequence? I don't, I, did, I mean, I've heard of the storylines, but I haven't really explored them. Is there a sequence that you need to do them in or is that flexible? How does that work? So it's pretty flexible. I, after reading through three out of the five, had decided I wanted to start for, for uh, the year with Search for Life because it connected to biology, which in theory they were supposed to have the year before. So in theory, they would come knowing the four macromolecules and knowing that um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus were your six main elements to all things organic and living. You know, it didn't happen, but at least it gave me a jumping off point. Um, they should know what DNA, DNA is. They should know what carbohydrates are. They should know what, yeah, should know. Um, and so at least you're talking somewhat of a language to jump in. In that unit, which took me nine weeks, um, you know, we touched on atomic structure and bonding and naming and 
organic chem and uh, static electricity and water and solutions, uh, you know, um, so many different topics that when you were done, you were like, oh my God, I can't believe I actually learned all that stuff. Like when I asked the kids, like, what did we learn? Like, and we went through and we, we listed, they were like, oh my God, like we didn't realize that we'd actually gotten that much done. And so that was kind of cool, even though it was by no way linear. Um, oh, and, and uh, polar and nonpolar and, and intermolecular forces. I mean, it was crazy how many different topics get hit on in just that thing. So while I, you know, got mad at myself for needing nine weeks to do it, but then I looked back and sort of flushed out all the things I touched on and went, wow, I did a lot in nine weeks, just not in my normal linear way. Um, so I don't think there's a, a specific order other than that one felt like it was the least threatening. The fuels one was very, to me, technical and it, and it needed more than I could have done in September, to be perfectly honest. Lauren, congrats on uh, fuels early. Um, nuclear, I think, stands by itself. Uh, could be, there have been years where I've taught nuclear with atomic structure at the beginning of the year. Um, then there was, of course, the year that the earthquake hit Japan and I stopped what I was doing and did nuclear chem as Fukushima melted down. And then there, of course, there was this year where I stopped everything and did nuclear chem. And then I couldn't really pick fuels back up. I, I just, I was in a weird place. I, so I ended up transitioning over to chemical reactions and redox um, instead. But again, the nice part about not having a curriculum map I had to follow was that I could do that and I didn't have to worry about the final because I was making my own final at the end of the year. So that flexibility was nice. If you're not, if you don't have that kind of flexibility, I know it can be. It can there, be there have been some other really good questions in the chat too. Um, Susan wrote in, I find it really hard to work together in a team to make common curriculum. If anyone has ideas about how to do that, I agree that can be very hard, especially if the teachers you're working with don't share your vision, not because it's better or worse, but like um, one of my colleagues is here and we collaborated on our honors chemistry course last year, which was great, but he and I had similar ideas about how we wanted the course to progress. And so we worked together really well. And when you you had mentioned like your team, like it was supposed to be the four of you and two off went off and one of you went off and one of you went off. If you're not, if you don't all agree on what you should do, it is really hard. I do find that sometimes you can at least come up with a framework mm -hmm. that you can decide. I like this worksheet or this activity or this, you know, I want them to draw this model or do this project, which might be different than the other people. Um, but at least a general framework of, of getting to the same neighborhood, maybe not the same address, um, has, has been helpful. I do a lot of work outside of my classroom and outside of my district. So I do a lot of stuff with Stannis. So that's Science Teachers of New York. Um, and some people in Buffalo, you know, they're, they're not going to, or, or even like somebody in Syracuse, that oysters unit can be really hard for them. They don't have oysters nearby. Um, whereas I'm off the Hudson River, um, close enough to the Sound Shore and the and the you know Long Island Sound and the ocean that you know we have more oyster connections. Um, I was talking to people just last week in Albany about the nuclear unit, and I tie in the nuclear power plant because we're within the 10 mile radius of Indian Point and Indian Point shut down last April. It's not off, right? We all know that nuclear chemistry says that radioactive things just don't have an on off switch. So it's, it's generating heat that's now just not being used. Um, and then what do they do with the waste and all that stuff? Some of the people in the group we were sitting in of seven or eight of us were like, well, I don't have a nuclear power plant near me. The kids don't understand that reference. So you do, right, within the same building, you probably have better references than if you collaborate in a big group. Um, 
you're going to have to find individual examples that connect more closely to your sense of place, which I think the storylines give a lot of room for. Um, if they can see it and and trust that it imp it really impacts something in their world, they're more likely to buy in and be willing to try to figure it out, figure it out, not be not not listen and learn, but figure it out because mm -hmm. they do better once they've learn something and then they tell somebody else and i think the storylines give a lot of room for that maybe maybe too much um i did cut out some of the ihub um stuff where it was very repetitive on sort of what we just learned because my timing might not have that might not have been appropriate and and it's flexible to that so you know, if you're on a block schedule, that's obviously very different than somebody who's, I'm on a 41, 84 inch rotating AB schedule for single, double, single, double currently, although they keep threatening to change the schedule. So you've got to figure out how to make that kind of stuff work for you. Um, that's interesting, Lauren, fuels, uh, nuclear before fuels. Can you... Yeah. Can you tell me why? Can you share why? Well, so I am like you when you struggle with standards based grading. I standard I, I, I struggle with um letting go of basic concepts and basic science as well, you know. So I don't view it as either or. So when I'm using the iHub and using these storylines and using problem-based and inquiry stuff, I'm still giving the kids who want the, I need to know facts and I need to know more basic information that the storyline is larger. The story or line you know, for nuclear energy is, is about the origin of the periodic table. It's about e equals MC squared. It's about radioisotopes and radio dating and the big bang. And so it's a, I, I, I look at that and I expand it and enrich it to even more so that right. you can see the connection between the origin of the universe, stability of nuclei, radioactive decay, and, and the whole nuclear unit. So I'd make it a little bit larger. Um, and then it sets the, and, and then it starts just, you know, we, as, as Americans, we have this tremendously irrational phobia of anything nuclear. And so like, why not tackle that right up front when particularly now when everything that's going on is, oh, now we've got these neighborhood sized nuclear power plants. What a perfect time to you know, as we delocal or you know localize the power grid and look for these solutions, it's a great way to begin that kind of conversation because the rest of it's pretty gloomy. You know, the kids are really depressed and gloomy about the state of affairs in the world. The fuels unit is pretty horrifying. The ocean acidification is pretty horrifying. The kids are incredibly engaged by it. I have kids that don't pay don't want to pay attention to anything, but they want answers for this and they care. And um, and so, you know, I, I see making that connection among those three, you know, those three things that there's this one unifying problem, which is carbon dioxide, and it's massive in its scope of its problem, and that there are these solutions, you know, maybe it's hydrogen, maybe it's electric, maybe it's nuclear. Um, so I, I use it as kind of a unifying uh, background sort of principle, and that's my rationale. Nice. I do remember that in Search for Life, I felt like we got to the periodic table, we talked about some valence electrons, talked about making ions, but then a lot of the other periodic trends were like missing. And so when the unit was over, I did a periodic table unit and sort of did the other trends and the other ideas and ionization energy and electronegativity and such. And, and I have to say it flubbed. It was right flat on my face following the storyline, which hadn't thrown that much concrete information at the kids, even though all the answers were right in front of them in our reference tables. Um, so that was a really interesting uh, experience for me. So like when Lauren said, you know, like you, you throw certain things in based on how you feel you've got to beef up certain parts and, and I have to be willing to let go of other facts. Um, you know, if they can look something up, then I don't have to make them memorize it. And, and I've pretty much been on that path for many years, but I definitely still have this checklist of things they must know about chemistry before they walk out of my room. And that, that checklist has to be more of like a, a vision board where I can put tax 
like on the map that we traveled here and there and everywhere instead of like a checklist um, that makes it feel a little bit a little bit better but yeah that you definitely gotta i know they all seemed like doom and gloom questions uh for the storylines i mean i guess search for life wasn't really doom and gloom other than i sold it as we're destroying our planet and we're going to need another one um because the environmental science person in me can't resist but to get on that soapbox um so that's where i circle back to constantly um, with water quality air quality energy uh resources you know non-renewable resources so thanks for giving me another perspective All right there's another question there are several interesting questions in the chat so one of the questions was about how much do you use or rely on textbooks when you're teaching with storylines or do you use them not at all? And if you use a book, are you doing, you know, digital books or hard copies? Or how are you handling that with the students? So my textbook is from 1996. It's an old Prentice Hall textbook, which does not align to the old standards or the new ones. Um, and nobody's bought me a new one, and I'm fine with that. I, in the pandemic, got to starting to use CK12, which is just a free online textbook, which gives them, like, go and read about this stuff but don't just google it because we all know that just because it was on google it must be true um <clears throat> so i do try to point them in in that direction um i do a lot of you you guys need to be able to source that and tell me that it's a valid resource that you use to to learn or to gather some information. So that part of the um, arguing from evidence thing is that I, I limit what the resources are that they can use. But uh, typically nowadays, because we've sort of gone to every student has a device, although they're not all school Chromebooks, even though we've tried to get them to do that so that it's easier on us, some of them still bring in their own device. And so then that complicates whether or not certain programs work. Um, but because my textbook was so outdated already, I, I've sort of given up on a textbook, um, in the last three to four years, maybe even five, I haven't handed out a textbook. Um, I saw the questions about AP and we don't do AP at chem in my school. We do SUNY chem. It's just a college level chem that's college credit instead of the AP test. And what our chem teacher, one of the people who went off and did the pair, um, she was having heart palpitations because she teaches both. And um, she uh, was like, this isn't going to be good enough for them to be able to do the college stuff. Um, give me one second. Um, so if somebody else is college bound, I would love for you to jump in for a moment. I need to step away for just a minute. So, you know, it's like that old Saturday Night Live uh, skit, talk amongst yourselves. Um, somebody else jump in and give some uh, AP info, please. I mean, I can sort of jump in. So Danny and I have uh, talked a lot this past year, last school year, because um, we are both implementing iHub and there are monthly kind of collaboration discussions about how it's going and any issues we're seeing and um, anything that anyone's come up with a solution. And since I am also the AP chemistry teacher um, at my district, I really wanted to see how my students were doing compared to previous years when I've run a traditional curriculum. And they, I put in the chat, but they flew through stoichiometry way better. Like I didn't have to explicitly teach it. It was kind of built in to the fuels unit in iHub. And so when I just gave them some practice sheets, when half my class was busy taking standard state standardized tests, I wanted to see how they do. And they did re like better than I was a expecting, especially for coming off the pandemic 
And all secondarily, like even compared to previous years where it's taken me much longer to get everyone to the same like ability to understand stoic, they were just able to like get it almost instantly, almost intuitively and run through it and do limiting reactants. And so, I mean, I haven't really seen the secondary, like I can't give you the post analysis of that class doing AP, but I'm much more confident in their deeper understanding of the content in order to apply it to AP than previously. And I think that's like, for me, what sold it on iHub was my students wanted it. Like each time I'd check in with them and see how they were doing it, if they wanted me to keep going on iHub or if they wanted me to do something different and more like traditional like worksheets or how they wanted it to work. And they really liked the iHub storylines. And, um, you know, they, I got, such high engagement that I like percentage wise wouldn't get otherwise you know you have students that check out that don't want to participate but they all really liked it there was another question in the chat too um related to this and Schiffer you might be able to jump in because you've experienced both ends um about maybe a hybrid we're doing some units has, with the storylines but other units um and danny had touched on this a little bit um but um other people who are working with, with storylines would be interesting to hear that discussion i mean i can go again i i saw some other some other people had done uh couple things too. I had started my year with gas laws and in a more traditional, you know, method that wasn't storyline driven, but had, you know, that same kind of initial phenomena, hands-on demo and labs and had them kind of build the understanding of it. Um, and my students just every time wanted me to go back to storylines and didn't want me to change the like because any unit like I was willing to like okay we did life now I can go to something else we can go however you want but um they didn't want me to do that they wanted me to keep going with the storylines and so I, I liked that each class could go at their own pace and so I could really let it be that sort of organic leading to understanding and I didn't have to be on a schedule and get them there. I mean, I'm also at a really tiny district, so I have that flexibility. No one's checking to make sure that all my students have this test on this day that covers this information. They got to learn at their pace and it varied from for each class just based on the personalities of the students and how they were able to move or grasp things or how long like I spent a whole class with um, one of my classes just doing different ways of experimenting with one of the labs because it wasn't working the way we expected it so we kept trying different things to figure out why and doing very very real science in troubleshooting like why is this lab giving us unexpected results and how can what can we do about that and so I I figured that was incredibly valuable as far as chemistry goes. And so I let them take that time. All right, any other questions or things people want to address? Uh, we do have a session on Thursday with Ashley McNeil, who's here in the meeting. And she's talking about, let me make sure I remember this correctly, the study strategies um, that she's been seeing her post-secondary students use and what's been effective with them. Another question came up in the chat about differentiating the material associated with the storylines for different levels of classes or even mixed level classes. So it's much easier to do it for whole classes um, in that sense, because if I have an entire class that's a higher level or a lower level, it's easier to take more time since it's really student driven and they can take more time or need more prompting or you can find additional resources to help them get to the same conclusions. Um, it's harder when it's a mixed level class and differentiating within that um, 
only because these um, materials are all pre-made. So if you, if I had the time to go through and amend and adjust, or if I had a co-teacher or like a para that could go through and like edit the materials, cause they're all Google Drive, so they're fully editable. And so if they could adjust them for students, that would be great for differentiating either down or up depending on student needs. But for me, like by myself doing a bunch of other preps, it's a lot more difficult because I can't just be like, oh, we'll just skip those or, you know, different. I can kind of say it or like mark those off, but um, I don't have like, here's some for these students, here's from some for these students. One thing that is really nice though, is that iHub has all of the resources in Spanish as well as English available. So if you have, Spanish English language learners, you have resources that are already translated for you. Um, I saw there was something else. Um, the other question that came up in the chat, are there other groups, listserv groups, or maybe Facebook groups um, that discuss the I have materials for, for teachers to collaborate? Uh, several people have mentioned, oh, I'm the only chemistry teacher in my district. For many years, I was the only chemistry teacher. That's not true at this time, but um, when you are, if you're the only one teaching your course or this thing at your school, it's really nice to be able to collaborate with other people. Um, and um, I don't know, does anyone have other information on that, those, uh, those groups? They must exist. There is a Facebook group for iHub Chemistry. I'm pretty sure there's one for iHub Biology as well. Um, and the Facebook group is nowhere near as active as like the AP chemistry teachers, but there are people that will post on that. And, um, like I said, there's a monthly call, um, like a zoom call where teachers discuss anything that's going on and how it's going. So that's how I, you know, how I know Danny, but, um, the Facebook group is also really helpful. I don't know if there's like a Slack channel or anything else. I haven't heard of any other listserv or anything specific like that. All right, well, this has been very helpful. Um, any other questions or things people want to ask? Uh, it's, you know, it's 10 after five. So um, I want to be respectful of people's time and um, we can, I can keep the meeting open for a while if people want to continue the discussion. Um, but otherwise, um, we can also think about winding things down, depending on what we need. Um, I'm so glad all of you were able to come and that you heard about the meeting and that you found it helpful. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future NEACT events. Let's stop recording. <laughs>